Well, good evening. It is good to be here tonight and welcome. Merry Christmas. We're grateful that we're able to gather to worship and to celebrate the birth of our Savior. And we're, if you're visitors with us tonight, we're grateful that you're here. We'd love to uh, see you on Sunday in our regular service. But we're grateful that you've come tonight to celebrate and to fellowship with us. And so as we begin tonight, I know that there's anticipation of a lot of things this evening, so it won't delay anything. And so I will go ahead and pray and have Pastor Justin come up as we continue and finish our Advent readings for the year. And so let's pray together as we, as we uh, contemplate what Christ and what God the Father has given to us tonight. Father, we thank you this morning, or this evening, Father, for, for our, uh, our time that we can come. Lord, for these days are certainly challenging, and they are weighty, and they have brought much angst on many, and Lord, we know that in light of all of this, that Father, you brought light into the world, Lord, you brought the Christ into the world, and that Father, that we might know, know you and be reconciled to you, and we celebrate tonight and are grateful tonight as we come. We pray that you would be honored in our worship, in our praise of you, and in our understanding of you. We're grateful, Father, for the salvation we have in you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can stay seated for just a moment. I'll have you stand for the reading of Scripture in, uh, in just a moment. Merry Christmas. As we continue our and complete our Advent scripture reading that began three services ago, go ahead and open up to John chapter 1 as we prepare for the reading. The word Advent from the Latin means coming or arrival. This is actually a very common term. It's a general term that could apply to many day-to-day -day and mundane things. But there's only one event in human history that is powerful enough to overtake a common term and fill it with eternal meaning and make it miraculous. The coming or the arrival of Christ. This advent was a fulfillment of God's promise made in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15 and one who would come to crush the head of the serpent. And since that promise was made in the garden, right after Adam and Eve had sinned against the Lord's gracious commands, the, Lord, the, the world began to look for and to wait for the coming of the promised one, the Messiah or the anointed one. Our first Advent reading in Isaiah chapter 9 reminded us that a child would be born and a son would be given. Our second reading from Luke chapter 2 records an angel making a pronouncement bringing good news of great joy that today a son was born. The third reading in Matthew chapter 2 teaches us that the son who was born was worthy of kingly gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And so tonight our final reading will be from John chapter 1. It's a reminder that though the advent was about the birth of a child, that this was no ordinary child. This child was eternal, with no beginning and with no end. God himself coming in human flesh. So please stand with me for the reading of the word. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5, and then verses 14 through 18. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through him, and apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. 14. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, 
glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. Let's pray together tonight. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you that this Advent, the coming of the promised child, was the most significant arrival in human history. So we know that the coming of Christ means that even though we have rebelled against your commands and we have sinned against you, that we can be saved from our sins and our transgressions because of your immeasurable gift of the Lord Jesus Christ. He existed in eternity past, but he came to be born to save sinners. We thank you for his perfect life. We thank you for his sinlessness. We're grateful, Father, for his death on the cross. We thank you for his resurrection, his ascension, his exaltation that forever secures the salvation of those who have received him by grace through faith alone. And so we come together tonight, Father, to sing praises to your name, to exalt the name of Christ, and to worship the Holy Spirit. You alone are worthy. And it's in the name of Christ that we pray these things. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Now we have the opportunity to hear the gospel via song. So let's listen together. Oh, holy night, the stars are brightly shining. It is the night of our dear Savior's birth. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. A thrill of hope the weary world rejoices, for yonder breaks a new and glorious morn. Fall on your knees, O oh, hear the angel voices, O oh, no. Divine, O oh, night, when Christ was born, O oh, night, divine, O oh, night, O oh, night, divine, humbly he lay, creator come as creature, born on the floor of a hay-scattered stall. True son of God, yet bearing human feature, he entered earth to reverse Adam's fall. In towering grace, he laid aside his glory. Now in our place was sacrificed for sin. 
Shepherds proclaim him as Lord. Let not the promised son remain a stranger in reverent worship. May Christ your adored. Eternal life is theirs who will receive him with grace and peace. Their lives he will adorn. Fall on your knees. Receive the gift of heaven. Oh, night divine, oh, night when Christ was born. Oh, night divine. Christ was born. Truly he taught us to love one another. His law is love and his gospel is peace. Chains shall he break for the slave is our brother and in his name all oppression shall cease. Sweet hymns of joy in grateful chorus raise we let all within us praise his holy name. Christ is the Lord. Oh, praise his name forever. His power and glory evermore proclaim. His power and glory evermore proclaim, O night divine, O night, O holy night. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Peggy. If you have your Bible tonight, uh, it's a little dark out there, so you can just walk with me tonight. We welcome you again on this Christmas Eve, and as we contemplate and celebrate the coming of the advent, the first advent of of Christ, our Savior. And most everybody loves Christmas, and we love the we love the Christmas time. We love the lights, we love the sounds, the treats, especially especially the gifts. And it seems like most everyone is a, a little better in a little better mood. Maybe. maybe. For the Christian, though, and indeed, the, it is a special time for us. It's a, a time which we celebrate the promise of the coming of our Savior 
and the gift of salvation. For as the angel of the Lord declared to the shepherds on the night in which Christ was born, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. And in our celebration and traditions as Christians, we, we buy gifts for one another and do so mostly for the ones whom we love. And so it is that it's a time that has been called the the season of giving, right? That's what we call it, or it has been called as you listen. Or, or for some, it's the season of getting. Is that you tonight? It may even be in reality called the season of forgetting. Forgetting the Christ for Christmas and all its giving and getting has created selfishness and, and want and unfortunately discontentment. And tonight as we come to celebrate the gift of Christ that is the gift of the incarnation, as we have studied in this last Sunday, I, I want to, to spend a moment this evening, not too long, but just a moment to look closer at the nature of, of this gift of the incarnation reflected from the heart of Christ, his love for undeserving sinners in giving the, the great gift of himself. And this is what we'll see in tonight in our text this evening is, is Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. And for those who are familiar with this passage in Philippians chapter 2, the context is of Paul addressing a, a selfish attitudes of some who were in the church. Imagine that, that there could be selfishness in the church. I know it's unheard of that you could think that we could think more of ourselves than we are, or put ourselves above others. But because of this, Paul exhorts us as believers and, and to have the same mind of Christ. And in doing so, he reveals the depths of the heart and the love of Christ in the incarnation. He it pours forth the depths of what Christ did for us, the gift of salvation in him coming. A gift that none of us deserve. And as we come tonight, and though none of us deserved it, indeed those who have received the gift of salvation by grace... The, the salvation that has come through the incarnation of Christ that Paul says here that we are to have the same attitude as him, particularly in relation to others. And so it is that tonight we'll look at this and ask the question, what was Christ's attitude? Paul tells us here in our text this evening in verses 5 through 8, he tells us in three reflections of Christ's attitude, his selflessness, it's serving and it's sacrificial. Selfless serving and sacrificial. What we see here is the, the heart of Christ in giving himself for us. It is the royal gift of God to undeserving sinners, undeserving people. So tonight, let's look briefly at these four verses as we do so, I want you to contemplate, if you will, tonight, this, the, the, the attitude of Christ and your own attitude tonight as you even go home and as you celebrate and as you reflect the true meaning of Christmas. Notice first the selflessness. He says, have this attitude of yourself, which is in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. Now, right off, you're thinking, man, Pastor, that's heavy for Christmas. And it should be. Can you imagine Mary, Joseph, the weight of the understanding of the incarnation? The reality of those who would ignore them and, and accuse them? 
and have nothing to do with them. The incarnation is very weighty, very overwhelming. But it reveals to us the love of Christ in a depth that we can't even imagine and can't even express and so easily fall short of and so often fall short of. And here, Paul, in this call for our own selflessness toward others, says and reveals the heart of Christ. And he says, first of all, the, he says the Lord, the Lord gave himself even though he existed in the high beyond us. He gives a glimpse of the pre-incarnate place of Christ and what he left, what his, he selflessly denied himself of. And notice the place of Christ. He first begins here and he says that he existed in the form of God. He existed in the form of God. By this, Paul is telling us the same thing that John tells us in John 1.1 that Pastor Justin just read earlier. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. The verb here existed is a compound word. It is a word that is, means, uh, it's a hupo arco. We have the word arco in the same thing as John 1.1. It means beginning, in the beginning. And Paul is reflecting the same thing, the notes, the idea of, of this continuance or remaining under a previous state or existence. It's a state that remains the same. And so he's saying, as with John, that, that Christ existed in the beginning. He was at the beginning because he is God, existing eternally. And so he says here, although he existed in the form of God, from the very beginning was God. The word form here is, a, is, a, is, a, is an English word that we struggle with in the sense of relating to this, this verse because we look at it as, as a form of something, not the same as. But that's not the single meaning in the Greek, and it's evident that's not what Paul means here. The word here, morphe, in the Greek, it can refer to something of the same essence or the same substance. It has the expression of something that reflects or manifests fully and truly the essence of what something is. And so it is that Paul is reflecting the very substance of who Christ is as God, the second person of the Trinity. That's why the NIV actually translated, translates it this way, uh, saying in the being in the very nature of God, Christ was God. This understanding is further substantiated in the, the rest of the verses. Paul said he did not, he says he did not uh, Regard equality with God, a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. The word equality, uh, isos, means to have the same quality or value or measure of another. And the fact that this is what it means is evident from other scriptures. In John, John chapter 5, verse 18, we see this in relation to the message of Christ and he speaks to those, to the Pharisees there and he says here to them that and gives this, this, this response to them and saying to them that the Father is working until now and I myself is working, am working and he is unequivocally revealing his deity to them. In fact, so much so that the, that the Pharisees got it, the Jews got it, they understood it. In fact, they wanted to do away with him. And they said here, for this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because he not only was breaking the Sabbath, but also calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. And so it is that Paul says the same here. This equality, this equalness with God, he says he did not regard it as something to be grasped. Even though he was co-equal, co-substantial, as we said on Sunday, that means of the same substance, the very substance of the Father, co-eternal in the triune Godhead, that Jesus gave of himself, said he did not hold it as something to be grasped, to hold on to, 
but we read here in our texts that he emptied himself. This word emptied is also a troubling word for many and has been used to reflect and to say that Christ emptied himself of, of his deity, of his person, which is not the case, although emptiness or empty, the kenoo or the, what we call the kenosis, that is the emptying of Christ, it means to remove the content of something, also figuratively means to lay aside something. That's the picture we get here. And for those who look at this and say Christ emptied himself of his deity, it, it is, it, it's clear from the Gospels that that is not the case. Jesus did not empty himself of any deity. In fact, it's an impossibility if Christ is God, the immutable God, the unchanging God, cannot empty himself of his person, of his deity. It's impossible. And so what Paul is meaning here by emptying himself is clear from the context is that Jesus willingly was willing to leave the glory of heaven, remove, remove himself from it, empty himself from it, deny the expression of it, to veil it that he might come and become the incarnate Christ, that he might become a man. It's hard for us to imagine this in relation to where the glory that Christ once when he was, while he was in heaven with the Father before he came incarnate that he shared. The disciples got a small glimpse of it, Peter, James, and John, at the incarnation, yet they could not see it. They, he was, his glory was still veiled. Moses saw just a glimpse of it because he could not see God and live. Christ veiled his glory. In fact, we know it was this because later in John chapter 17, verse 5, in the high priestly prayer, he prayed, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had with you before the world was. Jesus left the glory of heaven and made himself of no reputation, of no stately majesty, we read in, in Isaiah 53, verse 2 of no appearance that man would be attracted to him. The God of glory. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9 says that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. And this is what Paul says. He says Christ the servant, he became, or Christ the, the Savior was selfless. He did not look upon his place as something to be grasped, something to be held on to. But he selflessly removed himself from it to become what we see here, Paul says, a servant. Notice the second aspect. But he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Here we see the word form again. The same word, morphe. Remember what it means? It means, it means uh, to have something that reflects and manifests fully and truly the essence of what something is. And so we see here that Paul uses the same word to show him that Christ came, became Fully man. Christ did not subtract anything from his deity. We see here was an addition of human flesh. That he became a man. Jesus did not just take on the outward appearance of a bondservant, but the very nature of it. Here the word bondservant is, is doulos, slave. He became a, a slave, a servant. The second person of the Trinity, the God of the universe, made himself of no reputation, of, of taking on himself forever, the flesh forever, as a God-man. Forever to remain as God incarnate. James Montgomery Bo Boyce 
paints this picture of, of Christ's condescension, ascension, meaning that he came all the way down, condescended. He says, we can imagine the scene that must have taken place in heaven on the eve of Christ's birth in Bethlehem. God is omniscient, but the angels are not. The Bible tells us that there are aspects of salvation that the angels long to look into. 1 Peter 1.12. We must imagine, he says, therefore, that something like rumors of Christ descended to earth. Descent to earth had been in circulation around heaven for weeks. As the angels may have contemplated the form in which Christ would enter into human history. Would he appear in a blaze of light bursting into the light or to the night of the Palestine countryside, dazzling all who beheld him? Perhaps he would appear in a mighty, as a mighty general marching into pagan Rome as Caesar did when he crossed the Rubicon. Perhaps he would come to or as the wisest of, of Greek philosophers putting the wisdom of Plato and Socrates to foolishness by a supernatural display of his intellect. But what is this? There's no display of glory, no pomp, no marching of the feet of heavenly legions. Instead, Christ lay his robes aside, the glory that was his from eternity he steps down from the heavenly throne and becomes a baby in the arms of a mother in a far eastern colony of the Roman Empire. At this display of divine condescension, the angels are amazed and they burst into such a crescendo of song that the shepherds hear them on the hills of Bethlehem. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. You see, Jesus left the glory of heaven and made himself of no reputation. Taking on the very flesh and nature of man, yet without sin, so that he could give his life for ours. The royal gift is a sacrifice. It's a sacrifice. And this is what Paul tells us. Being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. It wasn't enough that Jesus denied himself his glory or that he humbly took on human flesh as a servant. He humbled himself even to the point of death on the cross for undeserving sinners. The crucifixion is perhaps the most cruel, painful, and shameful form of execution ever conceived by man. It was so cruel that the Romans would not allow citizens this form of punishment. They were exempt from it. It was only deserved for the slaves and the lowest of criminals. Yet Jesus willingly And selflessly came from the highest of glory and humbled himself to the lowest place of humiliation. All for us. So that we could be made righteous in him. His selflessness, his servanthood, his sacrifice was for our salvation, for us. The God of glory. came all the way down. And this is the royal gift we celebrate tonight, the gift of salvation in the Son. And Paul calls us to think about this attitude of Christ in our relationships with one another, in our service, in our walk, in this world, in our witness before men. Unfortunately, In the season of celebration, even in the months between, rather than remembering the royal gift of Christ himself and the attitude we are to have in him, 
we easily fall guilty of becoming selfish rather than selfless. Self-serving rather than serving and self-benefiting rather than sacrificial. Think about what our attitude would be tonight if we went home and we unwrapped the highest prize gift that we have. It's, it's, it's better than the Santa gift. And your parents said, son or daughter, I want you to give this to another. A person undeserving, somebody who's not even seeking it, someone who may not even want it. Now you know your parents aren't going to do that, so you're safe. But just for a moment you were thinking, my prized gift? The father said to the son, and the son willingly laid down his life for the sheep. John 10. of his own initiative, did not look and hold his equality's place in glory as something to be grasped, something to be held on to. But he emptied himself. That is, he denied himself and took on the flesh of men. And so on an infinitely greater plane, the Father, that's what the Father did in sending the gift of the Son. We remember Galatians 4, 4, God sent forth his Son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. This evening or tomorrow as you, you give the gift that you have under the tree or wherever you place them or hide them or keep them so that your kids don't find them. I hope that your giving and receiving, in your giving and receiving, that the, the royal gift of Christ himself will not be overshadowed by selfishness, self-serving and self-promoting. Most of all, my hope is that you have the royal gift of God and the royal gift of his coming, of receiving him. For the Lord told us of this royal gift at the beginning of his gospels. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And so tonight, think about the royal gift, what Christ did, what the incarnation is, it's selflessness, it's the bondservant, it's his sacrifice, it is our salvation. And if you're here tonight and you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, And the scriptures tell us very clearly that we will receive the consequences due our sins, and that is eternity apart from Christ in hell. But that's why Christ Christ came, to save us from our sins that separate us from the Father, from him. We read on in Philippians It says, for this reason, God highly exalted him, Christ, and bestowed on him the the name which is above every name, so that the name, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth. All that every tongue, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to, to the glory of God the Father. Everyone will bow. Paul is speaking here, everyone. 
even for those who reject Christ because it will be too late. But for you it's not. Everyone will have to stand before Christ the judge. But right now Christ says, I am your Savior. The royal gift. And he says, all to come to me, I will not turn away, I will not reject. And so tonight as we continue on in our our fellowship and our worship, contemplate the gift. Contemplate him tonight, tomorrow as you open your gifts. Not to forget. Not to forget. But to worship. To worship. Father, we're grateful tonight and Father for Lord, your, your great care for us and your love for us and the gift of salvation to us that came at great cost. That you, Lord, did so selfishly as our servant, as our Savior who sacrificed himself for us. The incarnation. Thank you, Father, that you came to us. Christ, you came to us, were made like us yet without sin so that you could be our salvation, our substitute. And so tonight I, I pray as we come, as we celebrate this, this wonderful gift and this wonderful night, this wonderful memory of, that you've given to us in your word to remind us of what you've done. That God, we would be those who reflect you and worship you and honor you selflessly as servants who sacrificially honor you toward one another and in this world. And know too that God, you will give grace to the humble and you will exalt the humble. And I pray tonight that Father, the proud one here who will not bow the knee or hasn't bowed the knee, that tonight they would bow the knee before you. And they would recognize their sin for you and they would repent of it and turn to you confess it and receive you as their Lord and Savior and receive the royal gift that is by grace through faith plus nothing and so if you're here tonight would you do that would you bow the knee would you bow it now because one day Every knee shall bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And tonight, Jesus is your Savior. Then he will be your judge. Lord, thank you, Father, for your grace. Thank you, Father, for the incarnation. Thank you, Father, for the royal gift in Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.